LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. What you feel. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there. Like a splinter. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. That you are a slave. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. Born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Right now, we're inside a computer program? Is it really so hard to believe? Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. This... this is real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. You have to see it for yourself. You have to see it for yourself. You have to see it for yourself. Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. I'm your host Greg Moffat and my guest today is Dr. Rory McSweeney, who returns for the final show of a three-part series discussing some of the ideas in his book, The Paradox of Lucid Dreaming, A Metaphysical Theory of Mind. If you enjoy the show, you may wish to explore the extensive archive at LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com. You can spell Legalize with an S or a Z. And there you'll also find a donate page should you wish to contribute towards keeping the site up and running. You can also follow us at Twitter, at Legalize Freedom, spelt with an S, and on Facebook as Legalize Freedom, a media news and publishing page. During today's show, we further probe the blurring boundaries between the micro world of quantum physics and the macro realm of our so-called reality, and those between the waking and dreaming states of consciousness. It would appear that as these apparently discrete worlds collide and cross over, the gulf between mind and matter, between thought and the physical realm, is narrowing at an increasing rate. Developments in technology, language and evolutionary biology are converging as we become more conscious of our individual and collective creative processes, carving reality from a field of potential where everything theoretically exists. Subjective experience, which mainstream science says we should ignore, is becoming increasingly significant. As these phenomena exponentially expand, 
What then happens to our preconceived notions of what is fact and what is truth? Is there, in the end, a hard, fast reality out there, or is it all just a story that consciousness is telling itself? Hello and welcome, Rory, and thank you so much for joining us once again on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thanks for having me back. Real pleasure. Now, today, Rory, we're going to be talking about some of the subjects raised in your book, The Paradox of Lucid Dreaming, a metaphysical theory of mind. Uh, we have already done two interviews uh, on these subjects. People can find the links to that on this interview page. If they're, if you're listening to this on YouTube, you need to get yourself over to legalize-freedom.com and you'll find all the relevant links there to, uh, as I say, our previous chat. So you want to get up to speed. Uh, before we dive into all of this once again, just tell listeners a little bit about your background and your work in general. Cool. So uh, my professional background, I'm a dentist, which means I am biologically trained and biologically inclined in terms of my scientific perspective. Um, and my personal life, I have pretty much spent, I would dare say all of it, at least all of it that I've been conscious of it, of it uh, practicing martial arts. And I've been doing that in a variety of ways as a sport, as a form of self-defense, but I think mostly as a philosophy. Um, and very much where I stand today is a fusion of my philosophy and my understanding of biology. Uh, and where I uh, come to lucid dreaming was probably somewhere in the region of the last 10, maybe 15 years or so when I got very interested in the uh, idea of ultra states of consciousness. Again, um, both from the biological and from the philosophical point of view. And uh, that culminated in my current position, which I have uh, addressed in my book, The Paradox of Lucid Dreaming. And uh, certainly what I, I think is uh, of, of great concern for us now is to ask that question, uh, why do we lucid dream? Uh, is it some kind of a, a byproduct of nature? Is it incidental or does it have a specific purpose? Um, it would appear to me that, you know, things that happen in nature tend to happen for a reason. Um, and I believe that there's a reason why we lucid dream. And in order to understand or perhaps at least investigate why we lucid dream, um, I think we need to revise our, our theoretical position just to have a bit of a, a paradigmatic disruption, so to speak. And that's precisely where I stand right now, right in the middle of that storm. Okay, well, we're going to come on to talking in detail about dreaming and about lucid dreaming in particular uh, a little bit later in the chat. But um, as I mentioned to you off air, today we're going to jump in at the deep end. The gloves are off. Um, if people want to get up to speed with the topics that we're discussing, then as mentioned earlier, they should listen to our earlier interviews. Um, but today I want to start with, uh, we're about two thirds of the way in my mind anyway, we're about two thirds of the way through your book and thinking about the micro versus the macro world. That is to say the micro being the world revealed to us, uh, in quantum mechanics, the macro world, the everyday world that you and I live in when we go to work, when we go to the shops, when we pay our taxes. Um, there's a dilemma here. Is this a continuum or is it not? It seems that uh, contemporary science, uh, mainstream science anyway, is at that point where, uh, the, you know, the micro world we can basically ignore because it has no effect on the macro world. But this seems to me, as I say, a nonsense because the macro world is made up of the same stuff as the micro world. It is all one continuum. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, really the, the kind of crux of the, uh, of, of the situation, isn't it? That we have two apparent views of of the physical world and they seem to be incongruent um and moreover as you say we we can't seem to kind of bridge the gap between the pair of them um i, I guess one would say if we can bridge the gap between the pair of them that's the equivalent of saying that we can somehow marry the two ideas in other words uh we have to find some sort of a theory that that ultimately describes both situations adequately, and that is the proverbial th theory of everything. Um, so I, I guess to some extent my, my own book addresses the same question and offers you a way of looking at that. And what I said was that we have an equivalent uh, position with our states of consciousness, which is to say we have the waking state of consciousness, in which case uh, the world as we experience it acts in a certain way. And we also have the dreaming state of consciousness. And once more, the world in the dreaming state of consciousness 
has a different behavior to the world as we experience it in the waking state of consciousness. Now, what I illustrate in my book is that we can look at uh, very specific properties in the dream world, and we can pretty much marry them to similar types of properties in the quantum world. Now, some people will want to jump on that and say that it's it's too far a leap, but I, I illustrate them very clearly. Uh, non-locality, uh, reverse causality, the fact that things are only apparently there when we observe them. I'm, I'm very specific and detailed, um, and I, I don't want to be accused of doing the proverbial take quantum physics, take dreaming, put them together, and voila. I, I, I've been very articulate in my concern for the matter, and I do see a very specific uh, pattern which would illustrate that there seems to be, in the one camp, we've got dreaming and quantum physics, and in the other camp, we've got the waking world and macrophysics, so to speak. Um, and as I said, there's very, very specific patterns there that would that would imply that they both should be in those uh, proverbial sets, so to speak. Um, the, the question is, how do we try to bridge the two sets? Well, looking at it from the point of view of physics at the moment, that would seem to be something that would need to have uh, a, a, a rather complex mathematical essay you know, in order to achieve. Um, and that would be something along the lines of string theory, M theory, higher dimensional theories, and so on. Um, they're mathematical essays that are way beyond the grasp of any normal human being. Um, from my point of view, the question I guess I got to ask is, is it possible to enter in an equivalent way into a state of consciousness that could potentially bridge the waking state and the dreaming state. In other words, is there a state of consciousness between waking and dreaming? Because if there is a state of consciousness between waking and dreaming, that would be, to some extent, equivalent to uh, a mathematical apparatus that would be uh, able to stand between the quantum and macro world, if you follow my line of thinking. Um, and the question as to whether we can enter that state of consciousness, as to whether there is a state of consciousness between waking and dreaming, well, the answer is that there is, of course, uh, a, a state of consciousness between waking and dreaming. Um, and that state of consciousness, whether we uh, enter it with intention, or whether we inadvertently enter it through pathology, would be something like schizophrenia. So for the schizophrenic, it would appear to the schizophrenic that the dreaming brain is leaking into the waking brain, so to speak, that their realities have become crossed over. Now, is in the intentional uh, induction of the schizophrenic state, I would turn to shamanism. So the shaman is by Terence McKenna's description, and certainly I believe McKenna was borrow that off, I think Alfred White Northhead, I'm not sure, no, maybe I'm wrong, it wouldn't be Northhead, I don't know, he borrowed it off somebody prior to him, Iliad or somebody he, re he refers to, uh, the idea that the shaman is a controlled schizophrenic, and that in traditional societies where people are inclined towards schizophrenic type activity, that instead of being ostracized as in our society, being taken into medical care, whatever, whatever we do with that, that in these indigenous societies, that people who tend to hallucinate, who tend to be able to see reality in that way, are taken aside and trained as the shaman. So it's a kind of a controlled schizophrenia, so to speak. And in that regard, too, the other way of looking at this kind of intermediate state between waking and dreaming would be, of course, lucid dreaming, which is also, by my understanding, a kind of controlled schizophrenia as well. Now, I don't normally throw that around because people would get a little bit haughty totty on the whole idea of me saying that. Um, a lot of lucid dreamers tend to be pretty conservative people, um, but the more psychedelic community would be a little more, uh, how would I say, a, a little more, uh, would have a little more sway with my language there. Uh, but ultimately what I am saying is that if we take the position that we have our two apparently, uh, apparently different and, and, and incongruent states of physics. As I said, we have the equivalent in consciousness. The question is, can we bridge them? And of course, we are bridging them with these states of consciousness. And, and I think that's the direction we should, we should be taking this question. We're noticing, those of us who are paying attention, quantum properties appearing in larger objects and larger systems. And I'm wondering, is this something that's actually an, an emergent phenomenon? Or is it something that's kind of, that we're, that, that we are only now paying attention to? If you see what I mean? Is this a, something that's happening on the increase or is something that's kind of always been, but we're only just noticing it now? 
Well, it's a bit like Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi has always existed at some level. It's just that did we discover Wi-Fi or did we discover the technology to to create the connection for Wi-Fi to exist? I mean, Wi-Fi basically is it's like radio waves. They always exist. It's just a question of us organizing them into a particular uh particular structure in order for them to 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 communicate information the way they do so to speak we didn't dis- we didn't invent radio waves per se we we didn't re- you know el- electromagnetic frequencies and the likes they, all these things exist um it, it's just our kind of i, I guess it's like looking at i, I keep <laughs> regressing the question but I'm, I'm trying to kind of forge the answer in a way that people can understand what i'm saying um it's the equivalent of taking a stone and asking is there a spearhead in the stone so to speak and the answer is, well, I guess there is or there isn't, depending on how you look at it. Um, what, what creates the spearhead is that somebody actually carves it out of the stone, so to speak. And I think technology is doing the same thing. It's carving pieces of reality out, so to speak. So it's not necessary that it does or doesn't exist. I don't think anything actually exists. I think everything, I think everything, and I literally mean everything, potentially exists. But what's happening is that consciousness itself is carving out reality. It's doing so through the process of technology, through language, through social interaction, through just evolutionary biology. All these things are just emerging as, as consciousness itself is literally carving out reality. And I think that's, I think we're becoming more conscious of that. I think we're becoming more conscious of our creative process that we're literally saying it's not a question of, can we do this or not? The question is, well, how do we do this? How do we create this thing? Um, and in order to do that, what it would seem needs to be in place is what I call narrative congruency. So in, in this regard, I like to think of reality not as this fixed object, this universe, this thing that's out there, but it's, it's more like a story that consciousness is telling itself. And ultimately, the story it's telling itself must be narratively congruent from chapter to chapter, from past to present to future, and so on. And what that effectively means is that there aren't these laws of nature as we describe them. I'm very much more on the same page as, um, as, as, as Rupert Sheldrake when he talks about the habits of nature. And I think the habits of nature, like any habit, can ultimately be guided and changed and ultimately broken if necessary. Um, and likewise, the proverbial laws of nature can be guided and changed and, if necessary, broken in order to accommodate that, but only if it's congruent with the narrative from the previous um, from the previous essay, so to speak. So in, in that regard, I think that what, what ultimately is changing reality itself is consciousness telling itself this story that we call reality, and it's doing so through the process of language and technology, and it's literally carving out new qualities into physics in the same way that we carved out the spearhead out of a stone. I think I mentioned or used the phrase in one of our previous interviews that based on my experience with with dreams and and hypnagogia that the realization occurred to me one day or one night that everything exists. And um, (laughs) it just reflected in, in what you just said. But I love this idea because I remember thinking many, many years ago that uh, cars, uh, computers, these things have always been here. Uh, the material to make cars and computers have always been on the earth. But it's just it took time for someone to put them together. That was well, all. He, well, here's an example. You know, as a lucid dreamer, <clears throat> somebody will say to you, so if you can lucid dream, you can do anything, right? And and the answer on the one hand is yes, you can do anything. But on the other hand, it's no, because anything would imply that you have the intellectual capacity to do things that are unbeknownst to you, because that would imply anything. But what we do have, in fact, is a kind of an intellectual horizon. It's, we don't actually know what's possible to create. I mean, I can't tell you what this planet will look like in a thousand years' time. So I don't really have the perspective to create anything in a dream. I can only create from my current intellectual resources. And they, of course, are informed by my cultural institution, by my personal background, by my biological system that I occupy, and so on and so forth. So it's, on the one hand, I could do anything in a dream. But on the other hand, I can't reach further 
than the thoughts of my own mind. I mean, I guess that's where the artist steps in and the artist takes patterns that we consider to be familiar and subverts them and creates new patterns. But even the artist has a limitation to their scope. We can't think beyond a certain, a certain, uh, horizon of possibility of of intellectual concern conceptually there are things that are simply beyond us we haven't discovered them yet um but they are possible so to speak now to say they're actually there already i i, I would still like to think of that more so as the stone that contains the spearhead the spearhead is in the stone it just needs to be conceptually carved out of the stone and in order for that to occur there must be some kind of a uh, a, a process of imagination to 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 kind of to birth that into being, so to speak. Um, and as I said, we are limited in the same way that the uh, the Stone Age people can't necessarily see beyond the carving of a stone. Likewise, we can't necessarily see beyond our intellectual horizon. Um, but the next generation will see further again, and so on and so forth. Each generation can see further than the previous generation, and this is the kind of the gradient of consciousness that it flows into the future. It flows in this kind of gradiated uh, matter, and this gradiated um, manner. Another thing, again, that's difficult to articulate, but it seems to be a phenomenon that is real, is the increase in value placed on personal experience and subjectivity when we think about reality and this is something that in the dream world is just a, a given you know that's completely a personal experience completely subjective normal rules do not apply do not pass go do not collect 100 pounds uh, all the rest of it do not get a you know, get out of jail free card or do get one whatever <laughs> and uh, <laughs> this is something that i'm wondering is this perhaps evidence of again one you know our, the blurring of boundaries in reality in our experience uh, that's actually happening is it something that's because uh, in one way it seems to hark back to earlier modes of consciousness uh, in human beings um but in another way it seems to be something new but i I've, i just noted it in a lot of areas of life uh some very consciously noted openly admitted others tacitly referred to others not at all but it's there if, if you look for it and it's just that all sorts of people in all sorts of areas uh, to repeat personal experience subjectivity this the value of this seems to be as i say on the rise so this is something i addressed in my book um and it was also something that terence mckenna pointed to he, he referred to it as the archaic revival yes um, and we, we, we were kind of coming at the, the thing slightly different angles what he predicted was that there would be a kind of a a a postmodern renaissance but instead of pointing back to classical times as in the previous renaissance um we'd be pointing back to actually more archaic times to mysticism to mysticism and magic and uh shamanism and the likes um and and kind of he, he didn't quite have the piece of the puzzle that i have in my hands which is that the reason i think that this is happening now and again this is no coincidence the reason it's happening now is because if I told you something was, a f and this is something I refer to in my own book, uh, I think the 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 the, the subtitle he heading is a, a plasticity of fact. And uh, what I said basically was that as as the world becomes more information saturated, what we define as a fact becomes more plastic because of things like Wikipedia. When I was growing up, if somebody told me something, for example, a platypus has got a duck's beak and it's got web feet and it's got a sting on its tail or something like that now if i somebody told me about a duck built platypus i might have said well that sounds like a crock of shit because i don't know any animal that looks or sounds like that but if the same person said to me when i was 10, 10 years old yeah but i read it in a book i'd be more inclined to say oh well it's probably true if the person said i read it in encyclopedia britannica it would be the equivalent of the intellectual bible i would have to agree that that is therefore a fact so we had a kind of uh, process of measurement of fact, which was the, the, the hardback book as published by certain 
you know, respected individuals. And anything that was within the covers of that book would be considered a fact. At one point, don't forget, God was a fact. Um, but w- what actually happens is, as, as religion starts to kind of lose its grip on society, as the age of enlightenment comes in, we, that's the first time that we recognize that people in authority don't necessarily know what's going on. A, and then as, as science, which we, which supersedes religion as the, as the kind of owner of facts, so to speak, um, progresses, we discover the internet steps in. And what the internet tells us is that scientists don't know what's going on either. So now we have somebody like Brian Cox, who is a particle physicist. Let me rephrase that. Brian Cox is a professor of particle physics. And by the way, he can't even tell you what a particle is because he doesn't know if it's a wave or a particle or what it is. So he's a professor of particle physics, and he can't even define a particle. So at that point, it becomes apparent to us that not only do our parents not know what's going on, our teachers don't know what's going on, the church doesn't know what's going on, and now scientists don't even know what's going on. And furthermore, what we have is we have a wash of intellectual opportunities uh, being being whitewashed on the uh, on the internet because we have things like wikipedia i mean if i said to you for example i read this in encyclopedia britannica you might be inclined to say well it sounds like a fact then if i said to you it's true i know because i read it in wikipedia you'd probably laugh at me but that's our current source of information we go to wikipedia or we go to youtube or we go to any other of you know thousands of websites to get our information so we can't really say necessarily what's true anymore because there's nobody there to police the truth anymore. The truth is kind of up for grabs. And what this does is this kind of redefines how we define reality. It's, it's no, it's no longer acceptable to just take a definition as prescribed by your cultural institution as things were done in our time growing up. I mean, we lived in our cultural operating system as a fact in the same way that generations before us around the world did the same thing. If you grew up in, even in Korea today as an example, if you want to look at a, an anthropological <clears throat> essay to describe this in, in, you know, in postmodern terms, you'd look at Korea. People who live in Korea don't know anything other than what they're told. That is the world as they perceive it. That is a fact. Uh, you know, what they are told about how the world works, that's how it works. Uh, fundamentalist, uh, religious people have an equivalent problem. They, they see that, you know, God is a fact and therefore by implication everything we're told according to that is also a fact. Um, but as I said, with religion losing its grip, with science kind of revealing itself to not really know what's going on, and finally, with the with the uh, the rise of the internet, information is becoming far more plastic, and because of that, subjectivity has to take center stage, and we have to start questioning things for ourselves, and we have to reevaluate how we define reality, how we define a fact, how we define anything for that matter, and that basically empowers a subjective form of thinking. Of course, the counter argument to that, of course, is that, well, the scientists will tell you that you know empirical evaluations still stand. And the thing is, I'm not denying empirical evaluation of, uh, of, of, you know, scientific concerns. But what I am asking is, how do we interpret that data? So that's very, very important in terms of science. We can agree with the empirical, what we call the mathematical empirical relationship. But the question is, how do we evaluate that? How do we interpret that? And interpretation of the mathematical empirical relationship ultimately lends to what we call a philosophy of science, something which historically we didn't even think existed, or for that matter, needed to exist. And now we have a a desperate need for a, a philosophy of science. So as we can start to ask ourselves, looking at the data, the data we agree on, but what does the data mean? And uh, that's really where the controversy is going to arise in the future. It's not going to be necessarily subjective. We still have to be philosophically pragmatic in terms of how we interpret the data. Um, I'm not suggesting that people should just go out and just take some wishy-washy model of reality and say, I saw this on some website and the speaker was impressive and it feels right, so it must be true. I'm not saying take something that's Because it's 2,000 years old, it must be wise, it must be brilliant, you know, a form of Buddhism or Hinduism, this comes from the ancients, therefore it must be true. I'm not saying that we should start taking those kind of stances, but what I am saying is we should at least 
start to negotiate our position on how we interpret things like consciousness and the quantum state. We shouldn't just be taking it as a fact that material is solid and that consciousness is a byproduct of, of complex chemistry. We should be asking questions like, what if consciousness is primary? And in order to do things like that, we have to revise our position. So subjectivity, yes, on the one hand, and of course, as I said, that's the reason why there is so much subjectivity today, but we must find a middle ground. We must try to respect the mathematical empirical data, um, but at the same time, as I said, we need to interpret the data and, and reevaluate how we do that. Your mention of the word particles is actually quite timely from my personal point of view because I've just finished reading a book that was recommended to me uh, by a guy called Owen Barfield. Uh, the book is called Saving the Appearances, and he speaks about particles as unmanifested, and he's thinking about the quantum realm now. This is a book that came out in the 1950s, very ahead of its time, and his basic approach was that uh, along the lines of something that you and I will be familiar with, and, and many listeners will be as well, that's to say that there, you know, there is no matter uh, until there is an observer. Uh, basically, there is no such thing as an unseen rainbow. Uh, which is a phrase from his book. And he speaks a lot about the distinction between reality and imagination and imagination as a tool of creation. And I think this is an idea that's really coming into its, its own now. Taking in the caveats in your previous statements, uh, taking those into account, the, the plasticity of reality and the, the role of imagination as a tool of creation, I think, is something that's that's really finding its its feet now, and it's one of the things that that science is struggling with. Yeah. Uh, um. So I mean, creativity really is it it it, ha it has a how would I say it has new meaning because of the internet. And and again, this is something I kind of pointed to loosely in my book, which was that we can literally take an idea today from our minds put it on Kickstarter tomorrow, raise a bunch of cash, that cash is then invested into development of that idea, and that idea is then manifested into something you can pick up with your hands. So if you think about what's just happened in that period of time there, that can be a very fast transaction from something that's made of pure thought, it's completely abstract, it's just an idea in your mind, to something that's sitting on your table. In fact, something that's sitting on thousands of tables tomorrow. And we can, that, that, that can happen in a very short period of time. So we're, we're kind of closing that distance between pure thought and something that we can physically touch. And we're able to kind of draw a very distinct relationship between the imagination, what we just thought about, and what he defines as reality. But the distance between those two things is getting shorter, if you follow what I'm saying. So in the waking world, again, this idea of narrative congruency that I mentioned earlier on, um, we would, let's just say, I think of some new invention that's going to make, I don't know, your phone do something it didn't do previously, whatever the hell that is. So I think about this, and then I go ahead and I put it in Kickstarter, and within three weeks, it's some viral hit, and everybody wants it, and some tech company come in and develop it. So within six weeks, we'll say, as some crazy viral hit, the whole thing takes off, it goes from my mind to thousands and thousands of cell phones, millions of cell phones around the world in six weeks. So if you think about that, as opposed to, say, for example, somebody thinks about the wheel, right? And they create some kind of a wheel. And then that meme, that idea, starts to spread gradually from town to town and eventually from larger areas to larger areas, eventually from country to country. And over thousands of years, the wheel travels and eventually becomes part of our world. But how long did it take for the information, which is the idea of the wheel, to actually manifest itself in the world to the same extent as my thought about the mobile phone manifesting itself today? So what we're actually seeing here is we're seeing a shorter period of time from something that emerges into consciousness to being experienced by the senses, so to speak. And that would seem to me to be heading towards a kind of a faster and faster and faster, more accelerated type of um, essay. And what one would eventually, I expect, going into a very uh, hypothetical future, is that the distance... And when I talk about the distance, what I mean is the distance in time, T1, T2. So that T1, T2 episode, uh, that, that distance in time, 
between, or let me say the time period, the time period between what we think and what we can touch with our senses will get smaller and smaller. That gap will narrow and narrow until eventually, in, through some kind of a technological process, we'll eventually be able to think of something and instantly manifest it. And of course, that's precisely what we're actually doing in a lucid dream. Um, in a lucid dream, what you think you can instantly manifest. This reminds me of, again, it's funny how often pop culture references come up when I'm, maybe it's just my mind as a, as a culture critic, I don't know, but uh, the, the same things come up again and again. And here we are, uh, I'm reminded again of The Dancers at the End of Time uh, by Michael Murcock. What he describes is it's a decaying civilization, you know, it's one that's not, it's in decline. But the point is that the people in it, the human beings, have developed just this very ability to manifest their thoughts in physical reality instantaneously. So they think 300 foot tower made from red glass, there it is, you know. And of course, this causes all sorts of problems uh, because, you know, anything, not everything we think of, we would necessarily want to see appear before us. But I do wonder about uh, some of the areas that, that we've been discussing where the mind-matter balance, where the interface uh, in human beings is going in future. Um, for example, you know, is, is telepathy something that we might increasingly develop? Uh, you mentioned Rupert Sheldrake. He's done a lot of work in uh, communication uh, beyond language, beyond the usual physical ways of doing things. Again, we're prompted here perhaps to think about, you know, what happened before the development of language. I've talked a lot, as I mentioned to you off air, about the limitations of language in human communication. Is language something that we will transcend? Where I stand on that again is this idea of narrative congruency, and I'll, I'll kind of pick up this idea. For me, it, if I said to you, say, 40 years ago, you can walk down the street right now and speak to somebody in New York, you think I was talking bullshit. But if I give you the same statement today, you'd say, well, yeah, I guess I could just FaceTime him, right? And you're like, well, yeah, okay. Well, what's so fucking magic about that? So all has happened there is that you have got a narrative script that allows for that process to take place. And it is congruent with the world that you live in. Consciousness is experiencing itself congruently in that regard. And as we progress, technologically speaking, towards more integrated kind of technological apparatus, we will eventually start to become, I, I expect, these, well, what, transhuman, so to speak. We will most likely integrate technologies in ways whereby we will literally be able to speak to each other without moving our mouths. My feeling is we will be able to think to each other, etc. Um, and for the people experiencing that, it will just be as normal as this conversation is to you and me right now. But this same conversation that we're having right now, what we're talking about, the way we're having it, to somebody from the time of Henry VIII would just be pure magic. It would be impossible. And yet to us, it's perfectly possible. It's perfectly normal. And we just take it for granted because it's congruent with our, with our reality. Each generation as will pick up from the previous generation. And what's actually going forward in time is the story itself, the story of consciousness. And each generation is able to pick up the previous story and run with it like a kind of a, how would I say, like a narrative relay, so to speak. Um, and I think that that's ultimately... I, I don't look to the past of this idea of, you know, could we communicate telepathically before we could speak and so forth. I, I don't necessarily... Or is there evidence of... uh telepathy right now, un unless it's narratively congruent with our understanding of biology, I, I don't think it is or has been possible for that matter, um, because it will be incongruent with biology as a whole. It will be incongruent with evolution. It will be incongruent with society, with the way the world has been built historically. It would contradict so much of our paradigmatic view of biology that I don't believe that it would make sense. It would be so narratively incongruent with our model of reality that it would just imbalance the entire system. And I think that's very, very important. And I want to just pick up the same idea with you um, with regards to lucid dreaming. So let's just say, for example, lucid dreaming, you said what you were talking about. I want to imagine a 300-foot red tower. In lucid dreaming, 
if you just said, okay, I want to imagine a 300 foot, uh, red tower in a lucid dream, I can tell you, chances are you would not see a 300 foot red tower. It's very, very unlikely that you would see that. The way you would see a 300 foot red tower in a lucid dream is you have to kind of create a story for the dream. You have to kind of story tell the red tower into effect. You might, for example, um, meet somebody and you might ask them, do you know where the Red King lives? And they might give you some kind of, as they often do, these kind of riddle type answers in lucid dreams. You'll often find the other dream beings speak in riddles. They might give you some kind of a riddle answer. And you kind of play along with that answer, whatever the answer is, by the way. And you try to direct that answer narratively towards something that would lead you to finding this 300 foot tall red tower. And whatever next scene unfolds in the dream, you kind of, again, coast it. You kind of go along with it and you try to nudge that narratively speaking towards this proverbial red tower you're trying to find. But what you'll discover is that all you can do with a lucid dream to manifest something is you can kind of narratively nudge it towards what you're trying to manifest. But if you just click your fingers or stomp your feet and say, I want to see so-and-so now, you can, it does work sometimes, but a lot of the time it won't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because it would seem to me that the dream doesn't have a kind of a natural narrative towards this outcome you're trying to achieve. But when you give the dream a bit of a narrative nudge towards what you're trying to achieve, you'll find it manifested much easier. And that, to me, is not just something that's happening at the lucid dream state. I think it's exactly what's happening in the waking state too. And I think that everything that's happening in the waking state must be narratively manifested into being. And when we become aware of that process of narrative manifestation of things, then we're starting to understand the nature of taking something from your mind and bring it to your senses, into the the world of physicality as we know it. That we know things don't just, I thought of something, and then it happened the next day. You say, well, I thought of something, and then I spoke to so-and-so, and he pointed me out to such and such, and then we developed this idea, and then we tested it, and then we took it here, and then we got to deal with these guys. And there's a whole story behind it. Notice that everything that starts as a thought and ends up in your hands, there's a story between the thought and the manifestation. And so what we, what we're becoming better at is we're becoming better storytellers. We're becoming better at telling the story of reality into existence. And you'll discover this with lucid dreaming. Uh, the better storytelling ability you have, the better you'll guide the dream to manifest things. And then you start to apply the same thing to waking reality. I want to achieve X in my waking reality. I can apply the old school rule of law of attraction. The more I think about it, the more likely I am to get it. Or you can apply the old, cross my fingers and hope I'll get it. Or you can say, I'll work really hard to try and bring this thing into my world. But if you're clever about it, you recognize that, yes, the law of attraction, to some extent, I agree with that. The hard work thing, nothing comes without hard work. But <clears throat> it's a question of, it's about what I call laying the correct narrative seeds for this thing to grow into your world. So you start to kind of leave narrative seeds around your reality and you watch them grow and you nurture them and you water them and you feed them and so forth. And the idea is you're nudging reality towards this outcome. You're starting to story tell whatever it is you're trying to create into, into experience. You're nudging the narrative to manifest your outcome. And that's, that, that, that is the, the very delicate nature of reality that I think we're only starting to understand. And this kind of comes back to this question you were talking about creativity again. I think that this is what creativity is. It's recognizing that reality is not made of building blocks like these impartial, objective uh, bits of matter that are just bumping off each other incidentally. It's not made of that at all. Reality is made of stories, and stories are made of words, and words constitute language. So in that regard, reality is a story you're telling yourself. And the name of the game is to try to nudge the story towards what you're trying to achieve. Yes, absolutely. I think there is a lot in what you have just said for people to take away when they're thinking about manifestation. You mentioned the law of attraction. This is one of the big themes these days, you know, that we, you know, we create our own reality and some people embrace it and some people dismiss it. 
utterly and everything in between. But I've been working with this for at least, tw- in fact, it's over 25 years and it works. Okay. Now, mechanisms, who knows? And I would just say, be careful what you wish for. But, <laughs> <laughs> and, and there, the, this emphasis you put on stories is so, so important because that has been my absolute experience. And I think that's where a lot of the contemporary thought and writing and, you know, information about the nature of reality and uh, the influence that our thoughts uh, have on it go wrong. So they, they miss this crucial element. And I think that's that's really, really key in terms of outcome. Yeah, it's a, it's a very delicate, very, very delicate idea, this idea of storytelling. Um, and you can take it as literal or as metaphorical as you like, but play with the idea. I certainly get at it in the book. Um, I, I certainly get at it as well when I'm doing live. If I'm giving a talk, I'll pretty much always get onto that idea. But I really think that a very tangible example of it is when you're in a lucid dream and you're trying to make something happen. I'm telling you, most people think that in lucid dreaming, that you just click your heels three times and say, I want such and such to appear. And if you go on to lucid dream websites or books or whatever, there's lots and lots of stories of, I wanted this to happen, so I just crossed my fingers and it happened. And a lot of the stories are just total horseshit. Uh, the fact of the matter is that manifesting things in lucid dreams is quite difficult. And the fact that it's quite difficult means we don't understand the mechanics of it. And when people say that lucid dreaming, well, it's all about intention. You just put your intention into it and then you get what you want. It's not like that. Intention is a part of it by all means, yes. But there's something else to it. And that something else, that X factor that we don't really understand, is what I'm trying to allude to, which is this idea of storytelling. You've got to create a narrative construct. You've got to create, you've got to kind of plant narrative seeds and nudge the dream to manifest what you're trying to uh, manifest. There, there are more and more stories emerging, thankfully, because they're obviously real experiences, not just the fairy tale ones people make up. There are real stories of people talking about lucid dreaming more and more. And more and more you're seeing people tell stories not about what they could achieve, but more so about what they couldn't achieve and asking, why couldn't I do this? Why couldn't I do that? Why couldn't I walk through the wall? Why couldn't I fly? Why couldn't I make such and such appear? They're not saying, I made such and such appear and it was all wonderful and it was all gravy and it was a fantastic time. Nobody wants to read that because it's totally uninteresting. It's self-indulgent. It's narcissistic. And in most cases, it's just made up anyway. Um, I'm much more interested when somebody says to me, I was having a lucid dream. I tried to do something and it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because that's a far more important question. And, and I feel that the answer is the reason it didn't work is not because I didn't put my intention into it, whatever the fuck that means. I think it's because we don't understand the mechanics of manifestation. And I think the mechanics of manifestation are best analyzed not in the waking state where the distance between, again, this word I'm talking about, the period between what you think and what you can touch at your senses. That period, although it's getting smaller, like I said, think about the time it took to imagine the wheel, to producing the wheel, to having thousands of people using the wheel, to today where you think of something, put it in Kickstarter and millions of people are using it tomorrow. So the, the, the time period from something going from imagination into millions of people's houses is getting shorter. The time between imagination and manifestation is getting shorter and shorter in the waking state. But in the waking state, it's still, it's still hard to kind of pinpoint the mechanics of it. But I think in a lucid dream, you have a proverbial microscope to look at the mechanics of manifestation. And when you're in there as a lucid dreamer, trying to manifest things, seeing things that you can manifest and seeing things that you can't manifest, and then contrast and compare, why did this succeed and why did this fail? On the back of my book, it actually says, why is it that sometimes we can fly in dreams and sometimes we can't? And that's the question I'm getting at. I'm not so interested as to why we can fly in dreams. I'm more interested as to why we can't fly in dreams. Because if we can't fly in dreams, well, what's stopping us? And when somebody says to me, oh, well, it's just your intention, it's a throwaway statement. We, we can't measure intention. But to some extent, we can measure that narrative structure. And we can look at it and ask ourselves, you know, what, what did I do? Well, I, I just wanted this thing to occur. The dream was like, yeah, it's not good enough. 
you've got to, you've got to, you've got to hint it. You've got to nudge it. And this is a really important concept that I'm trying to get out there. This makes me think about, uh, in terms of what might be possible in future, one of the first thing, things that occurs to me is, well, is that possible now? But we just don't appreciate it or realise it, if you see what I mean. Along the lines of what I was saying earlier about the materials for the car and the computer have always been on the earth. Uh, for something that we might be able to do somewhere down the line, can we do it right now? You know. We can, because we are doing it right now. I mean, let's just say, for example, your show. I mean, you're manifesting your show. You're literally manifesting it. But you're not sitting there crossing your fingers and saying, I believe in my show, I believe in my show, because somebody told me that's how it works. You're not doing that. What you're actually doing is you're actually going out there and actively creating the story of your show. You're putting, you're, you're putting narrative seeds into your show. You're making connections. You're doing the interviews. You're making sure you're pushing your videos. You're, you're pressing your ideas. You're speaking to people, having meetings, etc. So what you're effectively doing is you are giving fuel to the story of the success of legalized freedom. You're actually creating that story. You're actually actively pushing the story. You're nudging it. So when you manifest success with this, situation that you call legalized freedom in whatever way you visualize that sex that success to be when you manifest that you on the one hand yes you attracted it into your world at a law of attraction through your intention through your desire through your thinking about it and all that i agree but moreover what you've done is you've actually created so many narrative seeds that what you grew was a field of opportunities and those opportunities eventually blossomed into manifested reality. And that's what you're doing. You're creating the story. I mean, somebody could just say, well, all he's saying basically is work hard at things. I mean, yes, I am on the one hand, but on the other hand, I'm saying work hard. Yes, of course. But I'm also saying work with this idea of the story in mind. Just play with the idea. And as I said, in a lucid dream, you don't have to work hard to make something appear. It's not the secret. The secret to making something appear in a lucid dream is to tell the dream a story. Now, you apply the same mechanics to this world and say, okay, this is something I want to happen. Am I going to work hard at it? Of course I am. So, therefore, that's half the battle. But the other half of the battle is you got to tell the right story for the thing to... It's a bit like... It's a little bit like hard work is fertilizer. You put enough fertilizer on something, it will grow, provided, provided you got a seed in the ground in the first place. Because you can put fertilizer on, 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 on ground with no seeds and nothing's going to grow. Or you can put seeds in the ground and put no fertilizer and it's not going to grow. So the hard work is half of it. By all means, you've got to work hard or whatever you're trying to manifest. But what's crucial is that you've got to understand the nature of manifestation. It's about creating the story. And you are creating the story of legalized freedom as well as working hard at it. But when you start to, to see the texture of it as a story and not as just this, I'll just put my intention, I'll hard work, all the old school values, understand this nature of manifestation. The, the mechanics of manifestation is narrative. That's the kind of punchline I'm trying to deliver there. The mechanics of manifestation are narrative. Just, a, a, I suppose, a, a little bit of a 90 degrees angle thought here. Uh, one of my favorite subjects is uh, synchronicity, uh, coincidence. Call it what you will. As I have mentioned in previous interviews recently, uh, call it a cheeseburger if you want. It doesn't, you know, <laughs> it doesn't change the event. Uh, but synchronicity, when uh, you take things like that, into account when you appreciate those in 3D waking reality, uh, when you factor that into your day to day experience, the more that everyday, ordinary waking 3D reality, however you want to label it, becomes dreamlike. And this, I think, is very, it's very interesting to, for me, anyway, to consider this against the background of reading your book about, you know, the lines between waking and dreaming and where that's they start and where they end and where they blur and with particular regard to lucid dreaming of course and I think I mentioned this actually in one of our previous interviews about everyday reality having this dreamlike quality if you open yourself to it and uh, when you go there then it really is a case of Alice in Wonderland <laughs> <laughs> well it is I mean like it's it's just a question of uh, it's the same question you asked at the start of the show really which was that you know, where do you draw the line between quantum mechanics and macro mechanics? 
Yes. And, you, you know, in many ways you can't because at the end of the day, quantum mechanics implies four-dimensional space-time. Four-dimensional space-time is just the way we measure um, the universe at a certain level, but you can't say that it's <laughs> that it it's some it's 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 a departure from quantum physics. It, it's and you it's it's hard to know. I mean, is it is it an immersion property? Um, and if it is, then where is the connection with the with the source and so on? It's a very similar question you're asking. You know, where 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 is the line between waking and dreaming? Um, and where is that line between quantum mechanics and and Newtonian mechanics? I mean, they're, they're very blurry lines. Um, but once more, as I said, I think if you, if you do start to straddle um, the the kind of two worlds of waking and dreaming, um, and you spend more time straddling them, uh, and, and it's not just lucid dreaming. I mean, you can straddle the world of dreaming and waking with a joint. To be honest. Um, you know, the right quality of, of, of a good joint. Um, you can do likewise. I, I won't say what alcohol, <clears throat> I'm not sure what alcohol does to you. It's a depressant. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't have a psychedelic nature to it. I, I, I don't want to be, as I have been in the past, perhaps a little bit, um, blase about the use of drugs. Um, I, I think that we, what we need to do is to redefine the, the term drugs. I think drugs is a very derogatory term. It's an umbrella term that embraces far too many mind altering agents. Um, you know, alcohol is a drug and it's legal. The same person who drinks alcohol will tell you, I don't take drugs. They'll tell you drugs are illegal. And yet you walk down the s- street in the States. And if you want to buy a paracetamol, you go to a drug store. Um, so uh, again, these are just subversions of language that we've got ourselves tied up in. Um, so I, I don't really want to get into that necessarily. Suffice to say, there is such a thing as uh, mind-altering agents that are progressive for your consciousness, and there are certainly uh, mind-altering agents that are damaging to your consciousness. And uh, if you can't figure out which one is which, then unfortunately I expect you're uh, involved with the latter. Uh, but, you know, that's that's a whole other discussion. But the, the point of the matter is that when we start to kind of blur our states of consciousness, the, uh, the, the dreamlike nature of reality becomes more and more apparent to us. Um, and as it does become more and more apparent to us, if we keep pushing that, if we keep pushing that dreamlike texture to our reality, um, w- we start to not look at lucid dreaming as something that happens uh, when we're asleep at night time with our eyes closed, that lucid dreaming is something that happens when we're awake, that we realize that we're dreaming this reality into being. And ultimately, the 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 lucid dream that we that we're trying to have is the dream of being awake here and now that you're dreaming this reality into being at this moment and uh, to when we to to truly be awake um is to be awake in the dream of life okay um another thought that's just occurred to me somewhat randomly from something that you just said is i have found myself recently i would say particularly in the last year having experiences uh, i guess you would call them synchronous and i have said to myself usually out loud because it's been so striking okay universe i get it i realize that i'm being shown something i'm being told something and i'm wondering is this gathering increasing experience of mine purely personal because it doesn't feel like that it feels like something that i don't know maybe that you might be sharing or that other people i've spoken with might be sharing is it something that is I'm becoming more aware of through having conversations like this. I don't know. Is it something that we are all experiencing, but some of us are more aware of it than others? Is it a, is it a, a you know, a species phenomenon? I, I, I just don't know, but I have noticed it, uh, increasing. And I think about this in the context of, um, some of the points that you make again in your book about, um, time speeding up and reality itself being altered by the exponential growth in IT. That's the background to my, my thought here. So I, I don't know if you, if anything of what I've just said resonates, you know, with, with your own experience. Yeah, and it does. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that we have exhausted the existing paradigm. We have tried to live within the confines of the universe as an object, so to speak. 
um, which is impartial and is incidental to our consciousness, that our being here is a mere accident of chemistry and that we'll be quietly hushed off the stage when our part is done. Um, you know, we, we kind of bought into that for a while. You know, prior to that, we had religion and, and, you know, life was eternal and so on and so forth. And, you know, we were quite happy with that. And then the scientific era came in and hushed all that up. And, you know, we discovered actually we had evolved from apes. And in fact, apes had evolved from smaller life forms. And eventually we realized that actually we had common ancestry in bacteria and, 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 you know, prebiotic chemistry and so forth and suddenly it all seemed very very dry and arid um and eventually we we were we were atheized so to speak um into thinking that actually you know uh reality is this lump of rocks that are just spinning around randomly banging together and somehow coincidences stack up and biology emerges and eventually complexifies and apes start to communicate with each other using small mouth noises and invent technology and it's all very weird and very wonderful but it's totally incidental and at the end of it we all just disappear into nothing that's the story we've been told for the last couple of hundred years and it's been a very successful story by all means and there are people who are who are passionate about that story, which is rather ironic when you think about it. How can you be passionate about the fact that that for that that we that our, our <laughs> existence is so incidental? Um, but I I think that it, it unfortunately that story's done now. We've 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 exhausted it. We're bored of it, and we want to try a new story. Um, and and the new story um, is going to be one where we discovered actually that information could be passed freely between all individuals on the planet. In, at, in an instantaneous matter, uh, we move from the classical system of one to many, where one person tells everybody else how the system works, and we move to the many to many system, as I outlined in the book, whereby everybody can speak to everybody in any capacity. So one can speak to a thousand, a thousand can speak to two, two can speak to a million, a million can speak to a billion, and so forth. So we have just, just, you know, every, every possible way of communicating with each other, um, which basically means that we now have an infinite way of looking at understanding examining experiencing the world we can we can look at it from so many different intellectual angles that to say that one uh one cultural operating system is somehow superior to another it just doesn't hold weight anymore so what that does to kind of again uh reiterate something we 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 mentioned earlier on about the idea that the of, of subjectivity creeping in again is that it really does empower um our 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 investigation of reality as something that is very subjective. And when you start to subjectively investigate the nature of reality, you do not find that at the end of the rabbit hole, there's nothing but emptiness, darkness, just loneliness, this, this atheist world that's been described to us. But in fact, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And that light at the end of the tunnel is, is something so profound and so mysterious. And yet, most importantly, it's something to do with me. It's something to do with my consciousness, that my consciousness is somehow tying this whole thing together. And the only thing that is separate and yet part of you is a dream. Because in a dream, everything around you appears to be outside you. When you're in a dream and when you look around in a dream, everything appears to be separate from you as the dreamer. There's the person in the corner, there's the tree over there, there's the car at the other side of the street, there's the sky above you. They're not part of me, they're outside of me. And yet, and yet, if you know you're dreaming, you must know they're also part of you. So the dreamer the lucid dreamer, the one who knows they're dreaming, knows that somehow everything is outside of me. But all of these things that are outside of me, they're also part of me. And the lucid dreamer is the one who can make that intellectual connection. They can somehow straddle both states of consciousness at once where they realize that although everything is separate and everything is dualistic and everything is outside of me, it's also somehow, it's all part of me as well. So... I'm it, and it's me. The dreamer and the dreamer are one, and I'm it, whatever that is. Um, and that's the kind of state of consciousness that isn't just experienced with your eyes closed. You can experience that with your eyes open and wake in reality. And that's what we call the kind of non-dual state of awareness. 
So this non-dual state of consciousness, or deep awake as Tim Freak calls it, um, there are m many different kind of names competing for the for the center stage as to how we're going to define a state of consciousness, but it's it's becoming more and more prevalent. I mean, we have the, you know, we have websites, we have podcasts, there, there will be more publications creeping on stage, there is plenty of conferences, increasingly more so, and we're not getting together as we did 20 years ago, asking questions, is it like this, is it like, what is it, what is this thing, is it like this, is it like this? It's very much more themed along the lines of, well, I think we know what it is, so why don't we just talk about it and say what it is? We're not, we're not questioning it so much anymore. We're experiencing it. We agree with each other. We know what it is. So now we're just trying to build reality in this direction. And how do we do that? And this is where the idea of the, uh, the manifestation and the storytelling comes into place. So we're storytelling a new reality into, into being. And this new reality we're storytelling into being is one where we're connected in the same way we're connected in a dream, which is to say, on the surface, things are separate, but behind that, we know it's all one. And what you're experiencing, what I'm experiencing, and the reason we're having this conversation, the reason people are tuning into this conversation, the people, the reason people read my book, the reason I wrote my book, um, is because we agree. We agree that somehow we're connected in the same way we're connected in a dream, that on the surface, we're separate, but behind that, we know we're all one dream. And that we're starting to try to language that and storytell it into existence. Here's another thought again that wasn't scripted or noted down by me, but has come up based on something that you've said in your during your previous statement. And that is thinking about how we were as a species and how we are and how we might B. There's this tendency these days, particularly, as you say, since the scientific era, the scientific revolution of a few centuries ago, to think that we're somehow the finished product. And I think this is absolutely erroneous. I think we are very, very much a work in progress. I, for example, work in a cathedral, a Gothic medieval cathedral. And it has occurred to me many times when looking at the art and the artifacts and indeed the entire building, that the medieval mind was not the same as ours. These, and in fact, again, another synchronicity, this is an idea that comes up in the book I mentioned before, uh, Owen Barfield's Saving the Appearances. These people did not see the same world as us. It just wasn't the same. They didn't experience it the same way. Their consciousness was different. This takes into account all sorts of things that we sometimes struggle to explain. So where I'm going with this is that uh, we have no reason to think, I believe, that 500, 1,000, 100,000, 500,000 years from now, um, if we don't completely fuck things up, that human beings on this earth will uh, see the world, however it is then, in the same way that we do. We are, as much as any human beings that came before us, uh, a transitionary phase to what I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we, we see the world through a conceptual lens. Um, you, you know, the, the, there is scientific, um, and this is just a very rudimentary example, there's scientific evidence to show that if you don't have um, particular language uh, for a color, you can't see the color. So, for example, we wouldn't have seen orange until we actually had the word orange. We had red, we had yellow, we know orange. And that was up until about 200 years ago, I believe. Um, and until we actually invented the word orange, we couldn't distinguish red from yellow as to have the intermediate of orange. We'd say, well, that's a certain kind of red or that's a certain kind of yellow. But until you actually have the word orange in your intellectual vocabulary, you can't actually see orange. Um, so that's a very rudimentary example of it. And you can look at that too with uh, various um, various tribes in, in, in Africa and the likes, where they literally wouldn't have been exposed to certain color palettes that we're exposed to over here, and therefore wouldn't have the language to accommodate it. And you can actually put um, color patterns for them to look at, and they will pick out certain, let's say, hidden details in the color pattern. And in some cases, they'll pick them out very quickly. In other cases, they just can't see them at all. And then you can give them a test that they can see certain patterns in that we can't see the patterns in, so to speak. And the reason being because of their intellectual palette of color is different to ours. So they actually see 
the world differently to us. And that's, that's not subjective. That's something to do with the, the conceptual lens as forged by language. So again, this is something I kind of mentioned, um, in, in my, I say kind of mentioned. I think this is the fucking punchline of my book. But <laughs> I say kind of mentioned. The punchline of my book is as follows. For those of you who haven't read it, um, spoiler alert. Um, I, I, the, the theory I, I've, I've actually given the theory a, 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 a title subsequently, and I call it the the mimetic theory of lucid dreaming. And and what it effectively means is that uh, lucid dreaming is only possible by virtue of having the uh, intellectual meme to allow it to take place. So I'll, I'll put that very simply for you. If somebody said to you, can animals have lucid dreams? Well, the answer would be, first of all, in two parts. We believe animals dream. I mean, we, we're not animals having dreams, so we don't know necessarily, although we are animals having dreams, but you, you understand what I'm saying. Animals in the convention of the word. So we would say, for example, can a rabbit dream? Well, we think rabbits dream. That's that's everything in the biology, everything in the behavior, everything that we understand about the nature of rabbits would suggest that rabbits do, in fact, dream. But can a rabbit, for example, have a lucid dream? Well, the answer, according to my understanding of things, is, well, no is the answer, because the rabbit has no conceptual apparatus to say that something is a dream. It has no internal dialogue to appraise the world in the way that we do. You need to have an abstract language in order to be able to say, well, this is a dream. This takes place in my head. This takes place um, at nighttime when I sleep, and it's distinct from waking reality because the rules of gravity don't apply and because my dead aunt is there sometimes and she doesn't exist anymore, etc., etc. However you conceptualize a dream as distinct from the waking world, that's something that we only ever actually achieve as we get older and, and, and learn very specific language patterns. Children don't distinguish between waking and dreaming. They just see it as one continuum of reality. So to actually say that something is a dream, it's a, you need a conceptual apparatus to define a dream. And therefore, to have a lucid dream, you not only have to have a conceptual apparatus of what a dream is as distinct from the waking world, but you have to be able to import that conceptual apparatus specifically into the dream world. And you then have to try to bring that into effect by using an internal dialogue during the dream. So in effect, what I'm saying is that you actually have to import the meme of a dream into a dream and actually experience that in order to have a lucid dream. So therefore, the, the, the possibility of you ever having a lucid dream is implied by whether or not you have the uh, intellectual construct, which is something that's limited by um, your your intellectual, your your linguistic capacity. You need to have very specific internal language in order to be able to accommodate that. So a lucid dream, therefore, as I said, is a meme. It's a meme that you inherit from somebody. Somebody tells you that you can have a lucid dream. Once you have the meme that a lucid dream is possible, you can start having lucid dreams. Prior to that, uh, you can't have a lucid dream necessarily. You must have the, uh, the the conceptual capacity to have a lucid dream. Now, somebody might say to me, well, I had a lucid dream before I knew what they were. Well, I'm, and I, I don't, my, my model doesn't contradict that. Of course you could, because you still had a concept of what a dream was. And you were having a dream and you said, I think I'm dreaming. So the moment you say to yourself, I think I'm dreaming, you're employing a mimetic technology. And that kind of mimetic technology is not something that I believe could be available to something that doesn't have an internal dialogue in the same way that we do. You need to have a very specific type of language in order to accommodate that. And it's because animals don't have that kind of an internal language that we're aware of. They don't have that kind of self-reflective abstract dialogue that we have. I don't believe they can have lucid dreams. Yeah, that's one of my favorite aspects of your book, actually. You know, the idea about the uh, about conceptualizing something uh, in the first place and which making it actually physically possible in whatever way you want to use the word physical. I can't remember the name of Carl Jung's book about UFOs, uh, wherein he, I believe, speaks about the idea of uh, such things as uh, sort of a consensual dream in a way, uh, a collective projection. I think about, uh, you know, and it, again, you mentioned this in the book, you know, people having experiences that are, uh, that are individual and subjective, but then there's also, uh, as I say, shared subjective experiences where, yes, we saw the same thing, but then there being other people that I did not 
see that. And that got me to thinking about, well, for the people who didn't see the UFOs, what else do they not see? And then that gets us to the question of like, what's actually there? But it's just, it's just in terms of perceiving reality, the degree to which there's a, almost like a, a decision based in that, you know, whether it's uh, subconscious or not. Well, it's it's a it's it's a it's a really crucial point I'm making in the book. There, I mean, it, the whole point of the essay is to bring that latter point that we just but that I made and you just reiterated right there um, to light, which is that how we see the world, how we progress from one state of consciousness to another state of consciousness, is through a kind of an ingression of concept that we allow for more elaborate concepts to be um, intellectualized into our worlds. And in doing so, we open the doors of perception to actually see those things. Um, and in that regard, yes, um, I, it would, by my account, certainly become progressively possible for people to have shared experiences by having had an equivalent um, mimetic, uh, uh, an equivalent mimetic cultural operating system, so to speak. Um, but you'll see this in tribal systems, whereby the tribe can see something and nobody else can see it. Of course, we say, well, that's because they're having a group hallucination and they're all mad. And we're anthropologists and we're better than them. But that's just fucking horseshit. Um, I, I have described a, a very scientific way of coming at that in the book when I was talking about ayahuasca. And I think we touched about this in one of our previous talks anyway, so I don't want to get into it necessarily because it could go on a bit anyway. Mm. Um, but when I talked about the idea of synesthesia as experienced with ayahuasca and how if people were in a sense, as, as a synesthetic state of consciousness by taking ayahuasca that the shaman's music might direct their um aural interpretation in that they would direct their aural inputs into visual interpretations which would be congruent among the members of the group so again i don't want to start dissecting that but it is it's one way of looking at how a group hallucination would be possible and scientifically congruent um, with our current understanding of things, it wouldn't require anything weird or magical or anything of the sort. Um, but it, it, but that really is just another way of kind of, of, of trying to, trying to, trying to send home that message I'm trying to say, which is that the, I believe the evolution of consciousness, um, and of course, reality itself as a consequence is by, by by recognizing that it's about building new cultural operating memes and actively building them and embracing them and designing them and moving towards that um and 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 a very pertinent uh a, a, a very real uh as i said uh expression of that is how lucid dreaming is only possible by virtue of having a, a, a conceptual uh, realization of, of, uh, sorry, it's only possible by having a conceptual distinction between dreaming and waking, something that only occurs, uh, through the discourse of a, a, a kind of an, an elaboration of, of more sophisticated language. So I think basically what I'm saying is, um, if you ask me where, where the signpost of evolution is pointing right now, I would say towards language and towards more, m more just more elaborate forms of language. I, I think to say, to kind of define that, the, the reason people saw the world differently in the time of Henry VIII, um, or let's say 4,000 years ago, I think that that will largely have been fashioned by their language. Um, and I think that what's progressing is language. And Terence McKenna talks about this idea that language is a kind of a, is, is an entity and it's entered into a kind of a symbiosis with the ape, and that that is the organism. This kind of symbiotic relationship between uh, the the primate and language that they've kind of come together to create this new dimension of reality. And I really like that idea. What you just said, uh, part of it reminded me yet again on, on a previous experience of mine. And there's a song uh, where the lyricist talks about smelling the colours and hearing the lights. When we talk about something like that, that you refer to in a psychedelic state of consciousness, mm. for example, that makes me think about, again, this, this spectrum of reality from 
that sort of altered state through to what you and I are kind of experiencing now and, and probably most of the people listening to this are experiencing, which is, uh, I use very large air quotes here, reality to what <laughs> extent suggestion uh, plays a part in that too. Again, that's is something I've mentioned several times during our conversation. Uh, in fact, in one of our previous interviews, I talked about, you know, the experience of a psychedelic state and someone saying to other people that were in the same psychedelic state saying, oh, look at the the purple goblin on the on the on the floor and uh this person is seeing the purple goblin and suddenly other people are seeing the purple goblin because they it's been suggested to them that it is there and then i think about how that works in waking so-called reality mm-hmm. and i think about the world that we all labor under in the, in the media for example and we are told this is such that is such this is how it works that it, how, that's how it works whether it's religion or science, whatever it happens to be, this is how it is. And that's what we see. It's what we experience. It's what we live because that has been suggested to us. Then following on from that to just to end this rambling discourse, <laughs> uh, it occurs to me that we do not all live in the same world as each other. I may in fact live in a different world from you. Believe it or not, it depends how I perceive it, how I will it to be, what has been suggested to me, how I see it. And the people that you deal with day to day, the last person that you uh, interacted with before you got home tonight may have been living in a different world from you. And I think there's something in that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we'll have to agree on a certain mutual encounter. Um and oh, of then, course, of course, yeah. And, and then we can, and I think we can allow for both to exist. That we can, that again, again, it doesn't come down to a question of either or necessarily. Uh, this is something that I kind of offer as the kind of conclusion of the book. Really, is that um, any which way we come at this thing in trying to describe it either this way or that way, we end up with a, with a paradox, with a problem, basically, because we'll find that ultimately any description of reality will end up somehow chewing its own tail, um, and. Therefore, we have to allow for both to exist. And, and in that regard, yes, of course, we, we are having, as we said, mutual encounters. We're also having subjective encounters. And, and that therefore, as you, as you kind of alluded to, means that we have to question the very nature of reality itself. I mean, where is this thing we call reality in that regard? Can we say that it's out there? Well, not really. Can we say that it's all in here? Well, not really. Well, which is it? Is it out there? Or is it in here? Well, it's both. And it's neither, and it's either, and it's, you know, as I said, you, you, any which way you try to language it in our current state of consciousness, you run, you, you'll end up with a paradox. Um, so ultimately, what I'm, what I'm kind of alluding to, uh, again, perhaps not alluding to what I'm blatantly saying at the end of the book is that where we need to be headed is towards a language that doesn't try to define reality as either this or that. That's what physics does. Physics says, this is how it is. It's like this. They're not saying it's like this. They're saying this is... If you listen to Brian Cox as an example, Brian Cox won't tell you that physics has an idea of what's going on and it's something like this or something like that. He will tell you in no uncertain terms, physics knows exactly what's going on and what physics says it is, that's exactly what it is. Whereby a biologist will tell you, on the other hand, well, there's no such color as red, necessarily. Um, there is, as Brian Cox will tell you, an electromagnetic frequency, um, but there's no such thing as the quality of red. In order to have the quality of red, you need an optical nerve, and you need a visual cortex, and they need to be strung together with an optical nerve. And, of course, everybody's version of how that looks is going to be slightly different. Your version of red my version of red are slightly different, because... We don't have the same eye color. We don't have the same kind of optical nerve tissue. We don't share the same brain. So, you know, we can both agree to some extent that's red, but there's no question we're not seeing the same thing. Even if the electromagnetic frequency is of a certain nature, we don't see it the same way because we don't have the same optical nerves. We don't have the same brain tissue, so we can see it the same way. So what color is anything? So on the one hand, we can agree on the electromagnetic wave frequency, which is it's mutual. We can agree on the empirical data right there, but subjectively, we both experience it completely differently. So, again, you know, Brian Cox will tell you, yeah, but what's real is the electromagnetic wave frequency, and you say, well, if you say that that's what's real, what you're what you're missing is that the person who's saying that that is real must be accounted for in this in this equation as well. 
In other words, you can't say that something exists out there because the empirical data says so. If the person who is saying that something exists out there because the empirical data says so is also part of the pro is also part of the equation, you can't separate the human making the statement from the statement. So even if the statement is empirical and definitive and true, it's only empirical, definitive and true by virtue of the person who is actually saying it. And that person, therefore, must be considered as part of the mathematical system. Uh, otherwise, you can't isolate the measurer from the measurement. And if that measurer, i.e. the person, the human, is is has a subjective element to it, which of course we do because we're humans and we're biology and all that, and that we can go into that whole conversation. Therefore, there's always a degree of subjectivity to it. And yet, the empirical data is true. So you have, as I said, a paradox. You have any which way you come at this thing, you end up measuring it both as empirical and as subjective. So if you try to come down on either side, you end up with a paradox. And the way I would kind of close it is this. All physicists, if they take their art, let me rephrase that, all physicists, if they take their intellectual essay to its natural conclusion end up in philosophy and all philosophers if they take their intellectual journey to its natural conclusion they end up in physics so any which way you're fucked <laughs> well rory it occurs to me that over the course of uh, our three interviews we have probably not even scratched the surface here <laughs> uh, so i would just say maybe as a closing thought for today and people just need to get your book and then take it from there but as a closing thought i want to ask you about something you mentioned in the book that is that dreaming may have advantages for the organism and the planet as a whole just say something about that because that got me thinking i think it's probably the most important thing it's actually funny enough the the very thing that i kind of said at the start of the show, which was, you know, what I'm about. What I'm about, basically, is trying to find a place for this. I mean, as I said, uh, you know, lucid dreaming, it happens, we're certain. Uh, why does it happen? Why do we lucid dream, or why do we dream at all, for that matter? Um, and the reason I said, to kind of summarize this, why do we dream? This is my personal position on this. Nature, above all, prefers change, adaptability. We know this through Darwinian uh, theory of evolution. We know that when uh, species change their behavior models consistently, that they are far more adaptable to the pressure of ecological change. If you insist on the same behavior pattern and your ecosystem is changing, the, 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 the species will, won't survive. On the other hand, if the species is constantly changing its behavior, then it's more likely to be able to evade certain outcomes, evade certain predators, evade certain diseases, ensure the offspring, ensure the fact that the species will survive from generation to generation. So behavior modification, or moreover, interruption of behavior is very important for the survival of a species. So in order for a species to survive, and hence for an ecosystem to survive, and hence for an ecosystem to actually complexify and create new biological outcomes, what's important is that it constantly disrupts its behavior patterns. And so from my point of view, what I see dreaming as, dreaming to me is a kind of an advanced form of behavior interruption, whereby the species or the, the subject in question um, isn't in its normal state of consciousness. In fact, it gets to rehearse its life without its kind of classical state of consciousness where we have very specific behavior. When we wake up, we go to work, we eat certain foods, we speak to certain people about certain subjects in certain ways, only in certain fashions, we do the same job, etc., etc. But when we're dreaming, we get to perform all sorts of strange behaviors and do all sorts of weird stuff. But the reason I believe we're doing that is because what effectively doing, we're doing is we're actually interrupting and trying out new behavior models. And those behavior models, even though we're not necessarily aware of it, they're feeding back into our waking world and they're influencing how we behave in the waking world. So what we're effectively doing is we're, we're taking our behavior model and we're disrupting it and we're trying out new behavior models, and then we're taking those new behavior models and we're using them to inform and to try to change the uh, behavior models in our waking world, so to speak. So what that effectively is doing is it's slowly nudging our behavior away from complete, how would I say, uh, 
a behavior loop where we repeat the same thing day in, day out. It's slowly nudging us towards different behavior patterns. And by us behaving in different patterns, what we're effectively doing is we're interacting with each other in different ways. And what that's doing in, on a kind of a social level is it's creating more complexity in the social system. And what that's doing on a kind of a, on, on a, on a, on a larger scale is it's, it means that we as a species are interacting with each other in more creative ways. And hence we're creating new forms of technology to communicate with each other and so forth. We're basically our, our behavior model is complexifying and because it's complexifying, it's driving the evolution of technology, of interaction, of social interplay and so forth. And this in turn is basically catalyzing, um, the, 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 the planet, the planetary system. Because of course, as, as we evolve on a social level, we evolve on a technical level, as we evolve on a technical level, we evolve on a global level, as we evolve on a global level, we start to, um, produce technology which becomes trans-global, so to speak, because it actually leaves the planet and goes into outer space and starts to eventually investigate and fertilize other planets and so forth. So, again, this, this, this is not just going to affect us and our planet. It's going to affect, it's going to ultimately spread to a kind of an interplanetary essay. And again, this will drive more and more complexity off the planet onto other planets and spread out into the cosmos. And if we just take this to its nth degree, it effectively means that the universe itself is becoming more complex from this seed right here. Um, so in effect, therefore, what I'm saying is that dreaming is acting as a kind of a catalyst. It's a catalyst for consciousness. It's a catalyst because basically it's disrupting behavior. It means that we're interacting with each other in more complex ways, and that in turn has a knock-on effect to everything else, which eventually means the advancement of the entire cosmos itself. Um, and, 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 and lucid dreaming comes into that too, of course. Um, if we kind of take that to its nth degree, we can see how lucid dreaming comes in as well um, by becoming aware of the fact that we're dreaming that creates more complex, um, more complex, uh, uh, how would I say, more, more complex forms of, of, of perception. Um, more complex forms of perception means that we'll start to uh, create different forms of technology and because we create different forms of technology we will drive the global system into a, a, a more complex essay and this of course will inform everything else and it's, it's the same thing again but in, in essence it's all about increasing complexity increasing novelty as uh, Terence McKenna would say um, and I think that the moment that we became self-aware as a species this came into play because that in effect means we start to feed back and start to reflect and start to complexify our interactions. But dreaming is very important for that, as I said, right down to a rabbit dreaming. Because a rabbit's dreaming, um, I believe that that is going to allow the rabbit to interact in social mechanisms that it mightn't otherwise it mightn't otherwise do if it just repeated the same thing day in, day out. By putting it in more abstract situations, I think that it would ultimately that trickles into its waking behavior and then that complexifies its um its environmental interaction and so forth. Well, uh, to say the least, that's a pretty mind blowing uh point in which to leave our conversation for today. Uh we've been discussing Rory, your book, The Paradox of lucid dreaming a metaphysical theory of mind that's available everywhere uh, but tell folks about your website you've got your own podcast series of course and uh, just share anything else you'd like to put out there uh, well, listen, the most important thing is if you do read the book, um, enjoy it. Uh, a review on Amazon will be wonderful. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I, I'm on Reality Check Podcast. That's on Facebook. And uh, that's also on my own home site, wakeupinyourdreams.com. Um, but most importantly, I think, just support the ideas, you know, um, ask what's going on. Listen to Greg's show. Listen to some other shows, my show, um, you know, Stick your head up, look around, see what's going on. Um, people are talking about this. If you think what you're having is a fantasy or a mental breakdown, um, you know, you're not. What you're experiencing is what's happening. The world is going through a massive um, intellectual metamorphosis right now. We are going to be shedding the caterpillar body and we will be emerging as a conceptual butterfly, which we can't even conceive yet. So spread your wings and fly and enjoy it. 
a conceptual butterfly like that one. Well, <laughs> thank you, Rory, once again for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. My pleasure, man. Well, folks, that's it for another week. As ever, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed the show, check out the website, which is LegalizeFreedom.com. That's Legalize-Freedom.com, where you'll find an archive of programs offering alternative views on a wide range of topics, including politics and economics, energy and environment, culture, spirituality, history, and the nature of reality. You can also browse and buy a range of publications from our guests, and if you're feeling generous, make a donation to help keep the site up and running. Whether you listen, donate, or do both, I greatly appreciate your support. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to LegalizeFreedom.com.